It was a track intended to be part of the second rock opera by one of rock's greatest bands, a project that almost broke up the group and nearly took the life of a guitar god. The story of one of the greatest songs in the history of music, next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. I'm so excited for this one. You know what, if you used to camp outside uh, the ticket outlets to get the best seats for your favorite band, this channel was tailor-made just for you. Subscribe below, hit the bell so you never miss out on our daily content. And check us out on Patreon to help us develop more of this content and to become a curator and, and for more videos. The Who, one of those bands that emerged from the, the British invasion of the 60s and they became a preeminent fixture in music history. The Who shattered conventionalism, setting an elite bar for musicianship and artistic vision with a lineup of transcendent deity, rock deity, Pete Townsend with his intrepid guitar fury, Roger Daltrey with his booming vocal thunder, the improvisational brilliance of bassist John Entwistle, and Keith Moon, who many regard as one of the greatest drummers ever. Entwistle and Moon have uh, sadly passed away but Townsend and Daltrey have carried on well into the 21st century, still performing in front of massive audiences around the world. In 1969, The Who released the double album Tommy, primarily composed by Pete Townsend, which made history as the first successful rock opera. Townsend uh, came up with the idea for Tommy after being indoctrinated to the teachings of Mare Baba and attempted to translate Baba's teachings into music. Tommy, of course, the riveting story of Tommy Walker, a deaf, dumb, and blind kid, deaf, dumb, and blind kid. Sure mean who faced unique challenges with family and other relationships. Ever since I was a young boy, I played the silver ball. As he reaches adulthood, Tommy's afflictions are diagnosed as being psychosomatic rather than physical, and he becomes a spiritual leader. Following the top 10 success of the Tommy album, Townsend began conceptualizing a second rock opera that he titled Lifehouse. Lifehouse was written in two parts. The first section was inspired by the gospel of Mare Baba, who was Townsend's spiritual guru, while the second section was inspired by Terry Riley, an experimental composer that Pete Townsend regarded as a musical mentor. Townsend wrote Lifehouse uh, to illustrate what he imagined would happen if the spirit of Mare Baba was fed into a computer and then transformed into music. The final version of Townsend's uh, creation resulted in an exhilarating combination of Baba's ethos expressed in the style of Riley. Townsend honored both influences by titling his opus Baba O'Reilly. As we go into the story of this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I rock daily. At zenny.com, you can shop according to the shape of your face, and you can ensure that you always have a variety of, of really awesome, distinctive eyewear that look great on you. Go to zenny.com and design your own today. You won't regret it. Many of the keyboard riffs and sound effects on Bob O'Reilly came from Terry Riley, actually. In 1970, Pete spent several weeks experimenting in his home studio before putting together the part of Bob O'Reilly that sounds like a synthesizer that was actually played on a Lori organ. His objective was to create what he described as a replication of the electronic music of the future. Townsend's profoundly innovative keyboard arrangements on Bob O'Reilly, they're legendary. But when truth was told, Pete never achieved the sound that he was actually searching for. He kept trying uh, new approaches with his home studio gear, including running his keyboard through an ARP synthesizer sequence, but it wasn't working. Pete then used the marimba repeat setting on the Lori organ to create a complex uh, roulade pattern. Uh, Townsend laid down his instrumental track to tape. He took it to engineer Glenn Johns for his review. Pete expected Johns, you know, to alter what he recorded. But Johns was dazzled by the sounds, dubbing what he heard as perfect. 
Townsend's Lifehouse was set in an era where much of England was a polluted wasteland. Uh, Townsend portrayed his central figures as a self-sufficient dropout, family farming in a remote part of Scotland, that decides to travel back south to investigate rumors of a subversive concert event that promises to shake up an apathetic and fearful British society. Very deep. The lead character, Ray, is married to Sally, and the two of them embark on a quest to find their daughter, uh, Mary, who has run away from home to attend that concert. They travel through the scarred wasteland of Middle England in a motor caravan, running an air conditioner they hope will protect them from pollution. Sally, take my hand, we'll travel south, cross land. Put out the fire and don't look past my shoulder. The exodus is here. The happy ones are near. Let's get together before we get much older. Pretty heavy stuff. The most memorable lyrical part of Bob O'Reilly is the teenage wasteland. That segment of the song, so much so that uh, more often than not, the track is referred to by many as Teenage Wasteland. Teenage Wasteland was, in fact, a working title for Bob O'Reilly in its early incarnations as part of the Lifehouse project, but eventually the track transformed into a song with a slower tempo, different lyrics. Townsend has an interesting explanation for the term Teenage Wasteland, written for Bob O'Reilly, that we're essentially teenagers uh, traveling across the wasteland to attend the counterculture concert. In Pete's words, it's mainly young people who are either farmers' kids whose parents can't afford to buy them experience suits, then there's just scum like these two geezers who ride around in a battered up old Cadillac limousine and they play old Who records on the tape deck, end of quote. Pete called them track fans, in fact. Two of the most storied music festivals in history held in 1969 were major influences for Townsend's Teenage Wasteland, the narrative. The Isle of Wight Festival and, of course, the infamous Woodstock both of uh, which the Who performed as a principal act. Townsend recalled looking over the bounteous field at the end of the band's gig at the Isle of Wight Festival and uh, seeing the grounds covered in rubbish left by fans, which inspired the line, Teenage Wasteland. The Who's experience at Woodstock, where they went on stage at 5 a.m., was also deeply affecting. Townsend described Woodstock as the absolute desolation of teenagers with members of the audience strung out on acid. That was his quote. Ironically, legions of listeners interpreted Bob O'Reilly as a teenage celebration, a declaration of generational independence. When Daltrey yells out, teenage wasteland, they're all wasted. Love that line. Townsend uh, administers a scathing guitar solo after Daltrey's declaration that transitions into a symphonic coda highlighted by the frenetic drama of Dave Arbus's violin solo. The incorporation of the violin outro was actually the brainchild of Keith Moon. Brilliant, brilliant decision there. Uh, Keith Moon, of course, whose wild, impetuous lifestyle transformed into a musical madman who was worshipped by his peers. The Who recruited Dave Arbus as a guest musician from the progressive rock group East of Eden. After leaving East of Eden and lending his indelible contribution to the Who's Rock Classic, which brings a sadness to such a lively track, Arbus became an English instructor in Saudi Arabia. You can believe that. Following his stint as a teacher, he did some modeling and furniture crafting before ultimately reinventing himself again as a painter. The original demo of Bob O'Reilly clocked in at over nine minutes. Now remember, the track was intended to be multiple, you know, multiple movement as part of uh, that rock musical. It was new sonic territory for The Who with you know, cutting edge electronics and synthesizers, and frankly, 
other than you know Stevie Wonder, there weren't many acts that experimented with that kind of high-tech gear back then. Daltrey, Entwistle, and Moon were not down with Townsend's uh, Lifehouse concept, actually. They had a difficult time following the plot of the screenplay. Uh, to Roger, the Lifehouse concept of humanity surviving ecological disaster by living in pod-like suits made no sense at all. Neither did Townsend's a prophecy of the world developing a central grid to communicate. Additionally, they were not enthralled with the idea of doing another rock opera. The reluctance to produce Lifehouse contributed to Townsend suffering a nervous breakdown. In fact, the Lifehouse project nearly marked the dissolution of The Who. Townsend uh, tried desperately to articulate his vision for Lifehouse to his bandmates, and when that communication failed, he spiraled into an alcohol-related anxiety attack, nearly leaping through a 10th floor window of a New York City hotel room. Um, the swift action by an assistant who was in the room during Townsend's freakout saved Pete's life, actually, with the assistant physically blocking him from jumping to his death. The incident was Townsend's wake-up call, really. He was uh, drinking and working way too much. Uh, but Townsend was the world's most conflicted rock star, you have to remember. Mayor Baba preached peace, love, and a drug-free existence. It was a welcome alternative to uh, the Who's chaotic lifestyle, but you know, one that Townsend found difficult to fully embrace, as we all do. We all have our vices with the best of intentions to overcome to be our best. The rest of the Who were almost as conflicted. Roger Daltrey, who is the only member of the Who who hasn't uh, had substance issues, he was not interested in narcotics and barely drank. Ant Whistle and especially Keith Moon regularly uh, binged on booze, pills, and cocaine. Townsend avoided cocaine and had sworn off LSD since 1968. He was, however, still drinking and heavily. Uh, Roger Daltrey confided that the whole ordeal was the closest that the band ever came to breaking up. When Pete Townsend recovered from his breakdown, Lifehouse was aborted in favor of a non-concept album titled Who's Next? That included Bob O'Reilly and seven other tracks that Townsend had written for Lifehouse. Who's Next became the best-selling record of the band's career, though, and turned uh, this most dysfunctional British mod group into one of the world's most famous of the entire rock era. Who's Next was released uh, in August 1971. It went to number one in the UK, Consistent FM airplay on Bob O'Reilly. Along with uh, Won't Get Fooled Again, brilliant song. We don't get fooled again. Bargain and Behind Blue Eyes. I have hours, only lonely. Helped catapult the LP to number four in America, selling over three million copies. Concerts for The Who evolved into many symphonies, performed through ear-piercingly loud PA systems. Actually, The Who made the Guinness Book of World Record uh, for having the loudest concert in London on May 31st, 1976. One could effectively claim that The Who was the first stadium rock band, for sure. Bob O'Reilly was not released uh, as a single in the US or in the UK. Amazing, but it was a single in other parts of Europe. Its highest chart success as a single was in Holland where the song reached number 11. If any song in the history of rock deserved to be number one, it's this one, I'm telling you. Roger Daltrey performs most of the lead vocals on Bob O'Reilly with uh, Townsend doing the honors in the more subdued middle eight. During an interview with the street newspaper, The Big Issue, Roger Daltrey elaborated on the Teenage Wasteland lyric from Bob O'Reilly. I quote, Teenage Wasteland speaks to generation after generation, said Roger. If the bridge of Don't Cry, Don't Raise Your Eye, that's only Teenage Wasteland, sung by Pete Townsend, doesn't say more about the new generation, I don't know what does, end of quote. Roger added that the main advice he can give to youngsters is to be very careful with social media. As Daltrey put it, and I quote, life isn't looking down at screens, it is looking up. God bless you, sir. He also said, and I quote, 
but you're heading for catastrophe. With the addiction that is going on in the younger generation, your life will disappear if you are not careful. You are being controlled, and that is terrible, end of quote. Well, to the younger generation, I say, put your smartphone down, put, put away the video games, and put the who's next on the turntable. This is what rock and roll is all about. I mean, the first time I heard this song, it was, it was a revelation. I can't quite put the, the feelings in the words, but I'm gonna try, as I always do. The first part made me curious, but as soon as the bum, 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 as soon as that part came on, it's like my heart leapt out of my chest. It was the sound of freedom. I mean, the vision of pure and undiluted joy. It was a triumph of the soul. I'm usually a lyrics guy, but the fierce intensity of Roger Daltrey's passionate vocals. Townsend's thrashing and resolute guitar, the tragically beautiful violin, and Whistle's usual brilliance, and Keith Moon's mind-altering drumming. I mean, it lit me from within. I was a different person after the song finished. The world was just new to me. My heart aches, it really aches for the many of the young people today who may never experience that life-changing, universe-shattering power of rock and roll sorcery. It was like an out-of-body experience. I felt like I, I floated two feet above the ground for like days after. Baba O'Reilly is rock and roll at its height. Many have tried, few have come close, but uh, do you want to see your life more clearly? Play this song in a great pair of headphones after you finish this video and watch you know, unspoken rapture of the soul appear before your very eyes. I'm, I'm completely serious here. Bob O'Reilly is always there to put it all in perspective for me. It's just the sound of freedom. I don't have to be controlled. I don't have to be in a funk. Freedom is just a few notes away. Some drumsticks here. I actually got these from Zach Starkey when I did an interview. They're signed. I, I just love it. I mean, it's like that, that through line of the Beatles and the Who with, with Zach Starkey as their drummer. It's just amazing. Leave us a comment below about this amazing song, about this amazing band. What experience did you have when you first heard it? If you like our content, we do invite you to be a part of our community for good. Subscribe right now below. Also, check us out on Patreon if you want to help us to curate this music. And, uh, and also, if you want, if you want this life-changing song, this life-changing album, click on the links below. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.